Arzila is one of a string of Moroccan cities once held by Portugal. It was here that, after the death of Henry the Navigator, the Portuguese returned to fulfill their long-standing desire to claim Muslim territory. These adventures left few resources to continue their exploration of West Africa. But they had an indirect effect. Desperate for cash to finance the Moroccan campaign, the Portuguese king decided to lease African trading rights to a wealthy Lisbon merchant. An innovative approach to the business of exploration, we know of it because of 16th century historian João de Barros. As the king was very occupied with the affairs of the kingdom and was not satisfied to cultivate this trade himself, nor let it run as it was, he leased it on request in 1469 to Fernão Gomes, a respected citizen of Lisbon, for five years on condition that in each of these five years he should engage to discover 350 miles of coast farther on, so that at the end of the lease, 1,750 miles should be discovered, beginning from Sierra Leone, where the last discoverers turned back. Fernão Gomes was so diligent and fortunate that in January 1471, his agents Joao de Santarén and Pero de Escobar, both knights of the king's household, discovered the place we now call the Mina. For the Portuguese court, the contract was a pure windfall. In return for exploration rights and trading privileges, Gomes paid a large annual stipend. Gomes's men also did far better than the required 350 miles per year. Their first voyage went so far that it covered the requirements for several years' worth of exploring. And with the second, the Portuguese reached a very important place. A place they would come to know as Mina, or the mine. When the Portuguese first arrived in the early 1470s, Almina wouldn't have been as busy as it is today, but there was a small settlement. Its people were Fanti. Like their descendants, they would have been fishermen mostly, along with a few farmers and salt collectors. But there were also traders, some of whom ventured far inland to the Ashanti kingdom. And there they collected something Europeans had long sought something that would make Fernão Gomes a very rich man. The Ashanti Kingdom, it turned out, controlled some of the wealthiest gold deposits in all of Africa. They remain a vital part of the Ghanan economy. The Ashanti Goldfields Mine in Obuasi is one of the 10 largest gold mines in the world, turning out more than a million ounces of the precious metal each year. That makes Ghana Africa's second largest gold producer, and it makes gold the country's principal hope for the spark that will pull it out of years of economic decline. This was the gold that once made its way to places like Ceuta, the lure of which had set the European expansion in motion. Now that they were near its source, the Portuguese moved quickly to obtain a share. In 1482, John II, the newly crowned king, sent a fleet of 12 ships to Mina. It was led by Diogo de Azambuja, one of his most capable officers. After obtaining permission from the local ruler, Azambuja began to build a fortress. Here too, Baros is our principal source of information. The work progressed so rapidly that in 20 days the outer wall of the castle was raised to a good height and the tower to the first floor.
On account of the special devotion of the king for the saint, this fortress was called St. George, and it was later created a town with all the respective liberties and privileges. When this work was finished, Diogo de Azambuja sent back to the kingdom the ships with much gold that they had obtained, while he remained with the 60 men allotted to the fortress by the king's instructions. Others remained buried at the foot of the tree, where the first mass was said. There God is praised today, not only by our men who visit that town, but also by those Africans who, having been baptized, are included among the faithful. During the two years and seven months that Diogo de Azambuja was there, it pleased God that they did not suffer as much from disease as they had feared. And with so much prudence did he settle the prices and rules of the traffic that today the greater part of his regulations are still observed. The fortress of St. George still stands firmly along the Ghanan coast. But in the 500 years since its construction, it would become more than the first European structure in tropical Africa. In the course of that time, it would become a symbol for the very worst the West brought to Africa. A legacy so horrendous, it still deeply affects anyone confronted with it. The women slaves will be brought in and will be locked up in all of the dungeons here. The entire courtyard here had been for the women. Fortress guide John Kwa often conveys the castle's tragic history to Ghana's youth. Here you can find some of the original iron bars that they put in here. So in all cases, they will have bars in all of the openings. The big portions here had been doors. So you can even see some of the original hinges with which these were locked up. They would only be allowed to come into the open here. That is how far they will be allowed to go. So for however long you were kept here, one month, two months, or even three months, this is the farthest that you'll be allowed to go. These balls had been used to punish any of the women here that they considered to be disobedient to them. So if they wanted to punish you, they would bring you out here when the sun was high, and each leg would be shackled to one of the balls here. Elmina was the very first settlement of the European in this part of Africa. So when they started off, all of the ships calling from Europe had to come in. So almost all of the people that were taken initially had been sent through the Elmina Castle. They will be brought from the hinterland, will be held here for a period of time to await the arrival of the ships. Almina would play this role for more than 300 years. Hundreds of thousands of people were forced through here. This was something neither Africa nor any place in the world had ever seen. Before the arrival of the Europeans, slavery was known here. There were a lot of uh, tribal battles. And uh, when, after the end of uh, war, a lot of people were lost, those that had been taken as prisoners of war were brought in. And these people would be distributed among the clans and the various families. These had been treated as um, tr members of the family. So they lived amongst them and in course of time became integrated in the various families. This is quite different from uh, the slavery that came in when we're, people were taken across the Atlantic and were treated as properties of the Europeans who bought them. The people who were sent across would profoundly change the societies that bought them. But Africa too was affected in a way that is all too often overlooked. I keep on thinking, assuming the European had not come to Africa when he did, assuming Africa had been left to develop on its own, whether our plight would be as um, tough as it is now. You look at Africa now, uh, which lost a lot of its manhood. I don't know whether if you had been left on our own to develop our own way, whether you would not be prosperous. So one question that I have not been able to answer is whether 
you have been better off without coming into contact with the European when they did and what you have gained at the end of the day from this contact. But such questions were not on the minds of the first explorers. They headed on into the rising sun this time for the African coast had taken an encouraging turn to the east. Unfortunately, we know very little about their voyages. For now, Gomers, it appears, was mostly interested in covering at least 350 miles of coast per year. His sailors left few, if any, descriptions of the coast beyond Elmina. Densely forested river country, it provided few suitable landing places. No one knows whether any of them made an attempt to explore it. There is much more we don't know. Even Baros, writing just a few generations later, couldn't be certain of what happened during these years. At this time, one Fernau de Po discovered the Ilia Formosa, which now bears the name of its discoverer. And the last discoverer in the life of King Afonso was one Siquiera, knight of his household, who discovered the cape which we call St. Catherine. The islands of Sao Tome, Anobom, and Principe were also discovered by order of King Afonso, and other trading places and islands which we do not treat in detail because we do not know when or by which captains they were discovered. However, it is generally known that many more events happened and discoveries were made in the time of this king. Unfortunately, what may have been generally known to Baros remains a mystery to us. As the Portuguese sent their caravellas farther along the African coast, they kept the extent of their discoveries secret. They did not want others to know how to get here. Far too much was at stake. As a result of this growing secrecy, we don't know a great deal about the early history of the islands of the Gulf of Guinea. Traffic is sparse in these waters, with no more than a few fishermen heading this way, along with the occasional freighter. And once a week, the Sete Pedras covers the hundred miles that separate the islands of Sao Tome and Principe, islands that today make up the small republic that goes by that name. Though the country is approaching its first quarter century of independence, it is still evident who ruled these islands for the 500 years prior to that. As they did wherever they went, the Portuguese left signs of their religion, along with their architecture. Unfortunately, after they were forced to depart, they didn't leave a great deal of anything else. Virtually all of them fled, leaving a country with no skilled labor, a 90% illiteracy rate, abandoned plantations, and just one doctor. It has been an uphill battle ever since, for it wasn't until recently that the country steered a course to the west and began to open up somewhat. That has given hope to its people, people like writer Alda Espiritu Santo. She has returned to her literary roots. The history of her country provides plenty of inspiration. According to written sources, the Portuguese arrived in the 1470s at the islands. They noted that the islands were uninhabited. In 1490, the King of Portugal, John II, sent Álvaro Caminha with a group of people, among which were approximately 1,000 Jewish children, so that these children, taken away from their parents, could become Christian. Other arrivals included deported Jews and blacks from the coast, the African coast. And so, a multicultural society was assembled here, though for different reasons. The children were sent to grow up Christian, though few survived to do any growing up at all. 
The blacks, in contrast, were sent to work the fields. The fact that São Tomé was far from the continent allowed the process of slavery to be more intensive. And this, in turn, helps explain the rapid growth in the cultivation of sugar. There is no question that slavery made this growth possible. Unlike earlier attempts in Madeira and the Cape Verde Islands, sugarcane thrived in the rich volcanic soil of the islands. That, combined with a growing demand for sugar in Europe, triggered an economic boom. But Sao Tome's isolation made it vulnerable to trouble. There was a rebellion on a plantation in the region of Ubatas. Some sugar mills were burned down because the slaves rebelled against the working conditions to which they were submitted. The rebellion of Ubatas took place in 1517, and after that there was the so-called rebellion of Amador, which even managed to occupy part of the island. These rebellions would have a tremendous impact beyond Sao Tomé, because some of the plantation owners fled to Brazil. They took with them what they knew to be the key to successful sugar cultivation, black labor. And it was so that an experiment initiated on these small islands would be transplanted to Brazil and then to the rest of the Americas. It would force millions of black slaves on a one-way trip across the Atlantic. For those who remember, it will always be part of the island's legacy. I experience a permanent uneasiness because I wish that Santo Tomé e Príncipe, here at the end of the century, had already advanced more towards the modern age. The country has an intelligent population, a population that understands and is aware and that has the right to advance more to create the means to provide a sense of well-being and a balance to all its population. And it is through this disquietude and anguish that I try to live my hopes, because without hope there is no possibility of life. I hope these islands will have a better future than past. It is difficult to separate oneself from this sense of uneasiness, knowing that for most people here, it is a permanent part of their lives. It is even difficult to leave it physically. In fact, the rusty page, which maintains a regular link with the mainland, is one of the only options. Though she has seen better days, page is downright luxurious compared to some of the small Nigerian freighters that make it here. Page, in contrast, is up to the task. In fact, she's a bit like her home island, small and somewhat worn out, but still tirelessly going about her business. The moment she leaves the island's lee, Page begins to pitch and roll. But she does so effortlessly. After all, these are her home waters. The people who ventured here more than 500 years ago, in contrast, had no idea what to expect. But this time, they had a precise goal. When John II dispatched a new voyage in 1482, he ordered it to find the southern passage to the Indies. The man chosen to do so was Diogo Cao. Unfortunately, not a single contemporary record of Cao's first voyage survived. Even Barros has no more than a few notes, presumably because Portugal kept a tight rein on its activities. Diogo Cao went to Mina for provisions before leaving in search of Cape Lopo Gonzalves. He rounded that cape and also Cape St. Catherine. Then he reached a great river, and on the southern bank of the estuary, he set up the pillar to indicate he was taking possession of all the coast north on behalf of the king and for a long time the river was called the Pillar River. Later it was called the River Congo because it ran through a kingdom of that name, discovered by Diogo Cao on that voyage.
Not far from Cow's landfall, Page continues her passage. Behind are Cape Lopez and Cape St. Catherine. They retain their names, as does the country itself. Gabon because the foggy coast reminded the early navigators of a cloak, Gabao in Portuguese. Its northern neighbor also traces its name to Portuguese roots, Cameroon, named for the many shrimp or camaroche that were caught there. The mouth of the Congo River, where Cao and his men stepped ashore, has been passed as well. From here, the ship heads straight for Luanda, the capital of a country that would be greatly affected by its first Western visitors. In spite of the civil war that put Angola in the headlines for more than 20 years, here too there are plenty of reminders of those visitors. The Bank of Angola looks as if it was plucked from Lisbon and placed along Luanda's waterfront. As elsewhere in Africa, the colonial regimes had a desire to bring not only their customs, but also their buildings to tropical Africa. In Luanda, those buildings sometimes go back hundreds of years. Some of the churches date from the 16th and 17th centuries, proof that the Portuguese had designs on this part of the world well before Africa's great colonial era. But those buildings and customs reflect only one side of the story. Hearing the other side requires a different approach. An approach that takes us deep into Angola's countryside, to places where the stories from the past are still passed on orally from one generation to the next. The oral tradition here in Angola, as in all of Africa, is very important. Usually, in this region of Africa, it doesn't matter how old the people are. They possess a key knowledge about the objective and social reality. But the history of this kingdom can only be told by people who have heard it from other, older people, who held this knowledge prior to them. Virgilio Coelho is a historian and anthropologist. Researching Africa's rich oral history requires a background in both. We talked with the historian from the village. This historian, it is very important to understand, is the guardian of all knowledge relating to the oral tradition. He explained to us slowly and knowingly that when the first conquering sovereign from this region, who is called Ngoli Kilwangi, arrived here, he came not only to conquer the territory, but to become the owner of this vast region and to keep it for a long time. Therefore, the history he retold here dates back many years, perhaps 200 or 300 years before the Portuguese arrived. The arrival of the first white people also stands out prominently in this oral tradition, and it helps explain their cordial reception in this part of the world. There is a very strong relationship with the Atlantic Ocean because the Africans, the Congolese, as well as the Angolans saw the ocean as the place of the dead, the place of the ancestors. So, the sailing boats that arrived were for them the ancestors that were returning and when the ancestors came back, they would only bring good things. And of those good things, they brought plenty to what was, by all accounts, a receptive population. The Congolese, after getting over the surprise of meeting the Portuguese, immediately realized it was important to keep in touch with these white visitors. They did so because they were merchants, for whom the daily market, in their region or elsewhere, was of paramount importance. Therefore, we think that the Congolese people's acceptance of the Portuguese is closely connected to their way of thinking, and especially to their way of thinking regarding trade and trading. These were two totally different societies. 
they couldn't even talk to one another. But in trade and commerce, they had a language they both understood. This common language would give the Portuguese their first strong alliance in Africa. Before long, priests were sent to the Congo, along with artisans and teachers, to show its people the ways of the West, ways that seemed to be a sure path to prosperity. Unfortunately, there would soon be a breakdown in communications, which even the strong languages of trade and religion could not overcome. For the strong Bantus of the Congo and Angola, made for highly prized workers. Soon the growing demand for slaves in Brazil and the rest of the Americas began to deplete the local population. They were taken to the ocean to be shipped off, an ocean which upheld its reputation as the place of the ancestors, a place from whence there was no return. Only their spirits could make it back to the ancestral land. Traditional spirit dances took on a new meaning, for this was the only way people found out about the fate of those who had vanished. Whatever the response, it was never good. Slavery was a disastrous event for Angola. For many years, from 1578 until the end of the 19th century, Many Africans, many Angolans, departed to the New World. This happened systematically, virtually depopulating the country. So, a big country, nearly half a million square miles in size, has only 10 million people. In reality, it could and should have many more than we have today, possibly more than 50 million people, which would actually be ideal to take care of a country of this size. There is no question that our country and conscience will forever be marked by this horrendous event. Angola has a way of tugging at the world's conscience as well. Weakened after a long colonial war, the country proved an eager recipient of Soviet funds and ideas upon obtaining its independence in 1975. The West responded by supporting the new government's main rival, setting the stage for a devastating civil war. Only now is Angola climbing out of the depths the superpower confrontation subjected it to, and even now the peace is fragile. So here too, the ship that takes us onward somehow symbolizes the country that is left behind. A country that has seen far too much fighting in recent years, and as a result, is barely holding on. But a country also that is endowed with enormous natural resources and has so much potential that, if it can set its mind to peace, it might finally bring about those visions of prosperity its kings imagined with the arrival of white men more than 500 years ago. The coast south of Luanda looks much the same way Diogo Cao and his men first saw it more than 500 years ago. Cao sailed past here on at least two occasions on his search for a passage around Africa. Here they entered a different region. Gone were the lush tropical forest seen along the northern Angolan coast, replaced by a more barren environment. It was spectacular in its own way, but gave no indication of a passage to the east. Instead, the coast seemed to stretch endlessly farther south. With supplies and morale running low, Cal sailed as far as Cape Santa Maria, nearly a hundred miles south of today's Benguela. He erected another pillar there and turned back for Lisbon. Thank you. 
Two years after his first voyage, Cao was in this part of the world again, having been ordered to return to the Kingdom of the Congo and then sail beyond it as far as possible. He halted near the mouth of the Congo River and re-established contact with the local population. Then he headed on, past his earlier marker at Cape Santa Maria. Beyond, the coast took on an encouraging southeasterly slant, but grew more desolate reminiscent of the desert regions of Northwest Africa. Ashore, there wasn't much to be found, except for the skeletons of the thousands of seals that bred near here. So Cow headed on past Namibia's skeleton coast. But with food and water running dangerously low and few places ashore to replenish, it became clear the voyage could not go on much longer. At a small cape near the 22nd parallel, Cal went ashore. He obviously wasn't the first to land here. For seals and other marine mammals, the region was immensely rich. Fish abounded in the cold seas, sustaining a huge seal population. But this was not a land that sustained people easily. Vegetation was scarce, fresh water almost non-existent. Faced with the inevitable, Cow erected his final marker. A replica of it stands on the same spot. It bears the inscription of the original. It was 6,681 years after the creation of the world and 1,484 years after the birth of our Lord Jesus that the very exalted, very excellent, mighty Prince King John II of Portugal ordered this land to be discovered and these stone markers to be placed by Diogo Cao, squire of his house. Then Cao gave orders to set a course north towards Lisbon. It must have been a crushing personal disappointment, but there was no way his mission could go on. Besides, it wasn't as if he had failed. In two voyages, Cow had added almost 1,500 miles of previously unknown coast to the African map. Back in Portugal, John II was disappointed by the vast extent of the African coast. But as Baros tells us, he wasn't about to give up. So, having thought over all these points, which gave him an even stronger desire to discover India, the king decided to send out later in 1486 two ships by sea to check on these things which gave him so much hope. Two ships of up to 50 tons each were made ready, as well as a smaller ship to carry extra provisions, because very often on these long voyages the ships ran short of supplies and had to return to the kingdom. They left in late August of that year. Bartolomeo Diaz, royal courtier, was given command of the voyage. He already knew part of that coast. Six months later, Diaz's small fleet was off the Namibian coast. Not far beyond Cow's last marker, it entered a huge bay. Given the number of seals and whales in it, it was called Whale or Walvis Bay. Further south, the coast grew increasingly intimidating. This was where the Namib Desert, one of the most desolate regions on Earth, met the ocean. Diaz and his men sailed past dunes the size of which they couldn't have imagined. The landscape was hauntingly beautiful, though not a place to get lost. Here too, provisioning was out of the question. Worse than that, the winds began to blow so hard from the southwest that even the Latin-rigged caravels failed to make progress. The small fleet sought shelter. 
Near the 29th parallel, it was held up for five days by a ferocious storm, unable to continue towards the south. Barosz tells us that, to avoid being stranded here, Diaz decided to head out into it. It was a daring move. When he finally left, the bad weather continued, and he had to sail for 13 days with sails at half-mast. The boats were small, and the seas were getting colder. Then the weather, which created so much fury in the sea, abated, and they started to look for land by turning east. They thought that the coast still ran north-south. However, after a few days, they still had not sighted land, and they turned north, and they came to a bay which they called Vaqueros because of the many cows they saw there guarded by their cow herds. No one suggested it yet, but it appeared they had passed Africa's southernmost point. They noticed the coast was running in a new direction, no longer south, but east. But they couldn't be sure. After a few days of resting and provisioning, the two ships continued. The coast now began to turn to the north, proving that they had found the passage they had been ordered to find. Diaz wanted to sail further, but his exhausted crew objected. After consulting with his officers, he ordered course to be set for home. He was filled with such sorrow that it was as if he was leaving and losing a son forever. And he remembered the dangers they had all faced and how far they had come to achieve nothing more because God had not granted the main objective. When they left that place, they saw that great and noble cape which had stood there for so many years and it seemed to promise a new world of lands. Dias and his men named it Cape of Storms because of the dangers and storms they had suffered on rounding it. However, when they returned to the kingdom, King John gave it another name. He called it the Cape of Good Hope because it promised the long-awaited discovery of India. This indeed was the final piece of the puzzle. Nearly 75 years after their first venture into Africa, the Portuguese had finally rounded its southernmost point. From this vantage, one can sense why Diaz would have called it the Cape of Storms, having to round it as he did in a small caravel. But gazing east from here, one can also understand King John's new name, Good Hope, for now the riches of the east were finally in sight. It would take another nine years before da Gama left to claim these riches. An extraordinarily long time, it seems, for a king who appeared so keen on reaching the Indies. To understand what happened, we visited the Historical Society in Lisbon. There, a group of young historians recently developed an educational package on John II. It was headed by João Paulo Costa. It seems a long time between the voyage of Bartolomeu Dias and the voyage of Vasco da Gama. But uh, as a matter of fact, it was not so long because there was, there was much to do uh, and the, the main policy of the king was not only to get India. There were much more things involved and the most important was obviously Africa. He was trying to create new allies in Africa, to create new Christendoms in, in Africa and also to get new bases. Of those, the fortress of Elmina was obviously the most important with ships regularly shuttling between Lisbon and the Gold Coast, and the Portuguese gradually gaining a foothold in that part of the world. But there was much more. In the late 1480s, the king tried to establish a fortress and trading post along the Senegal River as well. Further east, in the Gulf of Guinea, a mission was sent to the Kingdom of Benin. A trade agreement was concluded, but so many Portuguese died in this unhealthy region that a permanent presence proved difficult. Around the same time, the Portuguese also began to colonize Sao Tome. This too used manpower and resources. Finally, during the early 1490s, 
John II followed up on a request by the King of the Congo to send missionaries and artisans to Central Africa. Here too, many Portuguese succumbed to disease, but the survivors began to convert the locals and implement the Congolese king's dream to make his country like Portugal in Africa. Portugal, in other words, was active on at least five African fronts. It showed remarkable foresight by its ruler. John II had really an African policy. It means that it was not a colonization that he wanted. He wanted to get African allies. Uh, it seems that he had already understood that it was impossible in that moment uh, for the Europeans to support the African climate because we have the idea that he was preparing black people to become priests. So it's interesting to stress that he wanted to establish alliances from equal to equal with the, the, the black kingdoms and with the, all the Africans. So this was really an African policy. Visionary as that was, there was more. Aside from getting bases and alliances, the king also wanted information about the east, so he would know where to send his fleet. And that could only be done by sending someone there. At the same time that uh, John II uh, sends uh, Bartolomeu Dias through the sea, he sent uh, Pierre de Couvillain and Afonso de Paiva uh, by land. Uh, they went to Egypt, and one would go to India, and the Indian Ocean, and the other would go to Ethiopia. So this shows that he was a meticulous king. He wanted to get most of the information he could before sending an armada to the Indian Ocean. Though Paiva died on his arduous trip, Covilla made it all the way to India and the East African coast. He dispatched a report of his findings to Lisbon, but no one knows whether it ever reached the king. From the way that Vasco da Gama uh, be, behaved in the India, Covillain's information didn't get, didn't reach Portugal because Covillain had the, the obligation to understand that the Indians were mostly Hindu and not Christians. Such as you can understand, there was a report and it was sent, but we don't know if he reached Portugal and that is one of the mysteries for that time. There are plenty of other mysteries that remain to be solved. Francisco Contan Dominguez has long taken an interest in them. Unfortunately, we do not know uh, too much things about the ships in the late 15th century. We have to search uh, a little bit later, er, late 16, early 17, and then with some more data we have from other sources, try to reconstruct the idea of what was the ships of Vasco da Gama, for instance, or Bartolomeu Dias. But we, we do not have technical drawings, we do not have precise information. So uh, I'm working with the early 17th century uh, treatise on shipbuilding. Though specifics are lacking, there's little doubt they were good ships. The Portuguese caravel was one of the most remarkable ships in the 15th century. It was said by Portuguese and by foreign visitors, like for instance the Italian Cadamosto, which says clearly that the Portuguese caravel was the best ship to sail the ocean. But when Bartolomeu Dias arrived in 88, it was clear that the ship was not large enough for a long trip like the one around the Cape and to arrive to India, for two main reasons. One, the ship is small, it's not enough to cargo, and it does not have capacity also to carry all the supplies that the crews need. Uh, one thing we do not think generally a lot about, but it is really important, it's the drinkable water, which takes a lot of space in, in a ship. So it was necessary to try to find another kind of ship, uh, cargo ships, uh, also able to carry the cargo itself and the supplies for the crew. But bigger ships created a different problem. Bartolomeu Dias proved that it was impossible to go to the Cape alongside the African coast. What happened from that point of view between 88 and 1497 is a mystery because we do not know if there were other voyages. It is possible that some ships were sent to explore the physical conditions for the navigation in South Atlantic. But for sure, we do not know anything. We cannot guarantee anything. In spite of such uncertainties, it appears that during the early 1490s, Portugal was ready for the voyage to India. We may then think that by the end of 92 or early 93, the king was prepared to send his fleet. Uh, he got all the information he wanted. He had the situation in the north of Africa controlled. He had the political situation controlled, uh, both in Portugal and in Spain. He had everything ready, but something happened that messed the whole thing up. That something was another explorer, who claimed he had reached Asia by sailing west into the setting sun. 
Columbus was wrong because no, nobody knew till then that he just discovered the, the islands near a new continent. But the idea that he had been in Asia gave to the Spanish kings the, a perspective for an Atlantic expansion, which they didn't add till then. So King John II and the kings of Spain had to share the Atlantic space, which was something that the king of Portugal never suspected that he had to do. And it was so that Spain and Portugal began to negotiate the division of the Atlantic Ocean. As was customary in matters of such importance, the Pope was asked to make a ruling. The Pope Alexander VI proposed in, in 1493 that the Atlantic would be shared between Portugal and Spain by a line from pole to pole, a hundred leagues west from the Azores. John II of Portugal finished by dealing with the Spanish alone without the Pope. The amazing thing was that he asked and he got from the Spanish kings not 100 leagues from the Azores, but 370 leagues. Why did the king ask 370 leagues and why did the Spanish agree with that? It remains one of the big mysteries of the history of the 15th century. Whatever the background to the mystery, Moving the line west caused it to run through the tip of Brazil, giving Portugal a huge chunk of South America. And it did so in 1494, six years before Brazil's official discovery. It makes one wonder how much they knew prior to that. The Portuguese of the 15th century were arguably the world's most daring explorers, but they kept the exact extent of what they knew hidden, even to their own chroniclers. With Spain's claim resolved, John II was finally ready for the voyage to India. Unfortunately, he wouldn't see the fleet leave. By the time the division of the world was negotiated in the fall of 1494, he was already very ill. A year later, he died. It was said of Bartolomeo Diaz, that he saw the land of India, but did not enter it, like Moses in the Promised Land. It applied to John II as well. He, more than anyone else, prepared the path to the east, into the rising sun. And in doing so, he irretrievably changed the path of history. <laughs>